start to people are still queuing by the door but since uh, we have a tight session of one hour uh, we'll start promptly and I'll go first through a couple of practicalities we'll be having five great speakers I'll introduce you later uh, and uh, because of the amount of program we'll save the questions to the end but if you have a good question you can do it while when you get it by using an app, an app which the uh, expo provides you. So, there's, uh, if you go, do you have the uh, Smart City Expo and World Congress app on your phones? Has anyone installed it? Quite a few. If you have it, great. Uh, uh, you can go to that and click the Ask and Vote option open, which is a question asking uh, application. When you ask a question there, it will appear on the uh, tablet I will be getting, and then we'll select, I'll select some just by dictatorial fashion some of the questions in the end to, uh, to address. If you don't have it, you can go to the www.smartcityexpo.com slash ask and vote, and you can get it from there uh, over, over Wi-Fi. So that's how it works. Uh, I will also take questions from the floor, so it's not the only option to ask questions to use the app. But uh, if you are absent-minded, it's good to do it when you think of it, so that you don't forget it if you wait to the end. Um, then to the topic of, of the day. Uh, the session is about real-time open data. And... Uh, we have uh, representatives who are from cities, who are from companies, providers working with cities, and, or lastly, enablers from Fiverr Foundation. And I think what we want to do is to focus on the uh, two aspects of, of open, open data, uh, real-time open data. First and foremost, the real-timeness. I mean, how do you manage the data flows? Uh, from, from, from cities, and then, very importantly, what do you do with it? I think the big, the trend now we have seen in, in the around data in cities that, is that the market is mature enough to blindly just chasing after all kinds of data to asking informed questions of why should we open data? What do we should we do with it? What's the benefit for cities? How uh, uh, and what are the showstoppers? of the market. Some of the things we will be addressing, first and foremost, very importantly, interoperability. One city is not the market. How can we ensure that the standards develop to support solutions which work across different cities, different domains? Then also questions about data management, real-time data is big. How do you work with that, that data? And concrete examples of what have cities and companies done will real-time data feeds, and how can we push this domain further. So with that uh, introduction, we'll kick the session off. We have a full house, which is great, uh, and we start as, is, as, as it is appropriate with the uh, city representative. Uh, from the city of Moscow, we have uh, the deputy CIO, from the Department of Information Technology, who is responsible for implementing information systems in all spheres of urban life and with a special focus on smart city projects. So welcome on stage, Mr. Andrei Belozorov. I'll take my papers away. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, one, two, three, one, two, three. Well, uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. And thank you, uh, Jarmo, for the introducing me. Uh, I would like to uh, tell a couple of words about how we do uh, public services in electronic form and how do we use uh, big data and how do we use open data in uh, real-time uh, APIs data for uh, managing and uh, uh, using, uh, using and servicing the services in electronic form. So, um, Moscow, uh, as a city, we have uh, 12 and a half million people per day, 
Um, you, if to take into consideration uh, uh, suburbans and people who come uh, to the city daily for studying and working, it probably daily uh, figure will be 15 to 16 million people. And we have 2,000 uh, governmental or municipal institutions, uh, schools, uh, health care, polyclinics, uh, traffic police offices, and so on and so forth. And all of those institutions are in charge of some kind of so, some sorts of uh, public uh, services. Uh, five or six years ago, there was only uh, 11 services online uh, on the web portal, and there were uh, 1,200 uh, contact points for citizens to come for the public services. And the, uh, getting the service from the city and municipality was like a, a real quest. You have to start and to go in one place to have, and to get one paper. You, you, you have to go in another paper. For another paper, you take all those two papers, three papers, go in the last one, and probably or hopefully you will get a service. Of course, that was a, a huge problem, problem for the city and for the citizens, and we uh, created uh, much more sophisticated uh, tools for uh, public services in electronic form. Uh, for now, uh, on the web portal, on the single portal, uh, everybody can use it. Uh, there are 200 public services in electronic form, and uh, if uh, earlier you have to go in three places or five places for the service, now you can drink a cup of coffee and take a service online from your home, uh, watching TV and so on. We have 10 mobile applications uh, in different spheres of city management, mobile application for electronic health, mobile application for uh, electronic voting, uh, mobile parking, and so on and so forth. And we have more than 350 million requests from our citizens and our guests uh, for our public services in electronic form. Of course, all of that services uh, could be impossible if we don't have, if we didn't have any data to manage and to use to provide a service. Uh, among the electronic form, we have only 127 uh, public service offices, and uh, we have in Moscow we have 127 districts, and every district has only one point to come. So if somebody cannot use internet and doesn't have a computer, uh, he or she can go to the uh, public service office and get any service in one place. But this is a convergent system, and uh, electronic form and offline form are inside the one electronic system. And if, for example, you can send an application for the service through the web portal or through web map, uh, or through a mobile application, and go to the public office, uh, public service office, to get a, a result of the service for some documents or so on and so forth. And uh, of course, to provide all those services in electronic form. We started and created all the registries and all the data we need uh, to provide all those services. So every clinic, every school, every kindergarten, every vehicle in the city are inside some of the, uh, some of the city IT systems. And all of, those, um, all of those systems created a lot of data. Uh, this data is uh, uh, from uh, our inside systems, but also we use different, uh, different uh, Third-party data, for example, we use data from our mobile operators about uh, the moving of the citizens uh, inside the city, and probably the representative of GC GSMA will be talking more about that, how, how to use those data. <coughs> and uh, the idea is that for now we have uh, citizen experience, we have uh, uh, kid and garden and schools, uh, clinics and hospitals, so we know the profile about this uh, person. Uh, of course, it is unpersonalized profile because we cannot use a personal data. Uh, it is uh, uh, forbidden by the law. But anyway, we know that there is somebody with a phone or email, and uh, we know the, his profile. Uh, it does she or he has children, car, what kind of flat or apartment, uh, and so on and so forth. We can uh, find his or her location by the mobile phone application and we know the moment, the moment uh, whether we can, <coughs> we can send an uh, information, a content or suggest to get a service from the city. And we started, uh, we started a special service, we call it MOS Robot. Uh, this is an automated notification system. So if before the 
public services was were uh, mainly on demand, so we are waiting while the person come to us through electronic channel or through offline channel, doesn't matter, but anyway, we are waiting for the person to get a service. For now, we know the profile and the momentum of the service, and we can send and pre-deliver the service to the citizen. So we know the channel, how to get a person through, through email, through applications, through Telegram or Viber and so on. And we have uh, data or content or service. For example, if we know that there will be a road work in this district, and we know all the car owners in this district, and we can send them that, you know, tomorrow uh, there will be a road work. So please use a public transportation or use, uh, I don't know, bicycles or go by feet to to the metro station, to the, to the closest metro station. Or if we know, for example, that uh, this person uh, never been in the polyclinics and probably uh, it is better to advise him or her to have a health check in the nearest polyclinic. And we can understand the right moment, for example, every five years we can send this message to him and suggest him the nearest polyclinics and the best time for him or her to appoint a doctor. And for now, uh, 3 million people, uh, citizens of Moscow, they use this service. They subscribe to the Moscow robot and, uh, ha and uh, getting those information about the services. So that's a small, uh, that, that's a small example I, I mentioned before about the real-time roadworks map and car ownership database and citizen database address. So we can uh, comply all those, uh, all those uh, information. Uh, inside one uh, to the one channel and send all the people who are uh, interested in that about the roadworks. And the same, the same idea is uh, about organizing all the services and uh, to go from on-demand services to automated, uh, automated lifelong guidance. So we know the life cycle of every citizen. Uh, kid in garden, school, getting in passport, university, driver license, and so on and so forth. And we can pre-deliver the service. So we know if, if, for example, tomorrow I'll be 17 years old, we can suggest him or her the uh, universities which are close, close to his home. Or if we know that tomorrow there will be 15 years, and in Russian law, 15 years is the age of getting a passport, we can send the SMS or email to this person and suggest him the nearest public uh, service office to get and uh, to have a passport. So uh, that's uh, probably the idea we are doing in now. And this, this, is a, uh, this is a summarizing the big data, real time data and the public services. So we have a very big amount of data. We, have, uh, we can have a third party data uh, through the APIs and we complicate this in, into one, uh, one figure, and probably this is a much better quality of the public services. That's how we use it, and that, that's what we are plan, planning to do in the future. So thank you very much. And probably the questions is after the... That's uh, right. Okay, thank, thank, you thank you very much. That very precise. That was a perfect, perfect example of timekeeping done well from... <laughs> And uh, we move onwards uh, to our next speaker. Sorry, just a second. I'm getting confused with my gadgets here. Very good. Okay. <laughs> Neil is already there. So uh, next one up is uh, Smart Cities lead from GSMA, who's been working in the uh, IoT strategy and development for a decade. Uh, with mobile operators and vertical service providers and GSMA, as you probably know, is the global organization for, for teleoperators. And uh, very interesting practical cases from Mr. Neil Young. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about uh, how mobile operators and cities are using um, some of their data to understand how people are moving through their cities, what transport methods they're taking, um, and how that's being applied. Um, so there's an awful lot of data out there um, that's sat in databases uh, and um, not being used at the moment. Mobile operators have a, a huge amount of data that they uh, have that just they collect naturally from their network, which they can use to understand how people move through a city, um, what sort of transportation they're taking, uh, and also you know, how they're doing that right now and how they've done it in the past and compare those different data sets. 
Um, so that, that data can be applied to a lot of different services through a city, um, from everything from kind of entertainment events, music festivals, um, sports stadiums, uh, to transportation management and capacity planning. Um, so that there's a lot of use cases for this data in terms of understanding how people move, um, you know, what their habits are, what transport methods they take. Uh, and as I said, mobile operators have access to an awful lot of that data. Um, so I've got a couple of uh, case studies of how operators are actually using that data uh, in cities. So this first one's in uh, Vilnius uh, from Tele2, who are one of the local operators. Um, and they've been working with the city to understand how people travel into the city, um, where they come from, um, and what kind of mode of transport they're using, how long it takes them to get into the city, uh, and then, you know, therefore what congestion and so on looks like. So they've taken um, an anonymized uh, set of data uh, that they've then um, applied across the city uh, and, and actually tracking in from um, each of these different areas you can see here is a, a different part of the city um, and how many people travel between each of those different areas. So they're not actually looking at individuals um, and where they're traveling to and from, they're just looking at that aggregated data um, in terms of how people generally move across the city. Um, and then they're using some big data intelligence, so putting a big data framework over the top of that to actually understand how people are traveling uh, into the city, um, you know, what locations uh, are popular throughout the city that people visit and so on. You know, and it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward to apply some of the filters on that. You know, if, um, if, peop if, if people are moving slowly, then it's likely they're walking. If they're moving faster, it's likely they're in cars and so on. And actually you can build up quite a comprehensive picture of how people travel around the city um, fairly quickly. Um, and that data is being used by the city uh, to actually understand where new infrastructure is needed to support that tra those travel plans, um, you know, where new public transportation uh, options need to be put into place, um, where traffic congestion occurs and so on. Um, and, and that data is being used right now by the city of Vilnius. Uh, moving uh, across to the other side of the world, to Singapore, uh, local, local operator there, Starhub, is doing something uh, very similar, again, where they're taking anonymized data uh, from uh, their network and understanding how people travel across the city. So they've produced a portal for the city of Singapore, uh, which lets them look at how people travel to, uh, from, from home to work and various other sites across the city. So in this example here, you can see um, the dense area down at the bottom left is actually the university in Singapore uh, and the flows going into that are where people travel from to actually get to the university. Um, so where the densities of people are in each one of these little hexagons you can see the number that's how many people are in uh, each uh, uh, little square um, uh, and how people are traveling so they can overlay this on top of transport routes, metro, bus and so on and understand get a really good picture of where people go. Um, and what Starhub is starting to do as well is overlay that with different data factors. So things like demographics, um, uh, education, um, lifestyle choices and so on. So they can get a very good picture of how people travel, um, what their needs are and how the city can actually respond to that and create better services. Um, so mobile operators have uh, several different sources of uh, data available to them. So those two examples were just using data from the network. So just data from base stations on the mobile network um, and understanding how people um, are traveling across the city. But there are other uh, sources of data as well which can be aggregated together. Um, so for example, from uh, smartphones, you know, it's, you know, probably everybody in this room has got a, a smartphone sat in their pocket and so um, you know, there's, there's ways to understand that, particularly through download of apps and things like that. People can understand uh, how people move um, through personal uh, wearable devices and also through sensors, so IoT sensors, so things like um, cameras and Bluetooth beacons and that sort of thing are all valid sources of data for location to understand how people travel uh, through a city. And actually when you start combining those sources of data together, then you get some very powerful information sets. Um, so this is an example of a music festival. Um, so you can see uh, here that this is um, very much more detailed information uh, than in the past. So uh, the people at this festival are, be, you know, are being tracked on site by various different means, um, including apps and Bluetooth and, and location data. 
Um, and you can see that uh, the actual organiser of that event is able to get a huge amount of data about what people are doing on that site. So they're able to understand how many people are on the site, um, what the crowd densities are at different stages, how long the queue for the bar is, um, how long the queue for the toilets are, all the important information you want at a music festival, basically. Um, and all of that data is coming uh, from those different sources and being combined together into this one interface for the uh, music festival organiser. Uh, another example is in terms of transport loading. So um, rather than a city having to invest in new infrastructure, uh, you know, they can maximise the capacity of existing infrastructure by making sure that they cram as many people as possible into uh, every train carriage. Um, and so by using IoT data, location-based data, you can understand how many people are actually in each, each carriage and how that changes based on weather and so on, and actually provide passengers with information about you know, where empty spaces in trains are so that they can actually move up and down platforms, move up and down the trains, which you get um, in, in, onto, the, onto the train itself. Um, so, so mobile operators have a few different uh, capabilities that, that are very good for, uh, for these sort of projects, crowd management. Um, so they're obviously able to kind of understand where, uh, how devices are used and how they travel through a center, through a city, um, how those IoT sensors can add into that mix to provide more um, uh, precision. Um, but mobile operators are very good at understanding data uh, and working with big data, putting machine learning on top of that. GSMA has a big data framework where um, we're working with Fireware mm. for coming up next to actually put in place some data frameworks and APIs and so on to actually understand that data. Um, and then operators are good at analyzing that and giving um, the information back to the city. Um, so crowd management is a very powerful tool that I think we're only just starting to see the beginning of um, and offers really good, high quality insights uh, to a city based on um, existing data um, and, and some location data analytics. Uh, both commercial companies, so stadiums, shopping malls, as well as uh, governments can benefit from that data. Um, and mobile operators are in a very unique place in terms of offering that. They have those networks across the city. They're able to provide that um, high level view of how people move through it. Uh, and then adding in those IoT sensors gives uh, a really great sense of depth to that data. Um, and, and also you can focus on different areas, so focusing on people, focusing on transport networks and so on are all different um, areas that can be there. And that's it from me. So GSMA has a smart cities portal, um, which is here on the screen. If you go and visit that, uh, then there's lots of these use cases, plus more uh, videos and papers and so on. So please take a visit and uh, find out some more. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil. Uh, just came to my mind, I probably never told you who I am. So just in case, I'm Jarmo Eskelinen. I'm from the Free Cities Catapult. I'm very glad to host this session here today. And next one up, we had already mentioned Fireware. Uh, Juan Hierro, who's quite recently appointed uh, uh, CTO of Fireware Foundation, formerly from Telefonica, and uh, who also has been chairing the Fireware in it for quite a while. So what is Fiverr all about? Bueno. All right. Thank you very much, Jarmo, for your introduction. And uh, good morning to, to everyone. Um, well, uh, I would like to start saying that uh, more important than listening my speech is that you visit us in our stand, uh, the Fiverr stand that will be in the exhibition area. Why? Because there is where you will be able to find out the stories, the stories of people, of companies, SMEs, uh, as well as big, that together with cities are making things happen and making this whole vision about real-time open data uh, be materialized. Uh, that is what Fiverr is about, is about uh, making it happen, about uh, uh, going to execution. We have been talking a lot for a while about vision, vision of what a smart city is. It's now time uh, for execution. And, well, real-time open data is one of the major aspects. And real-time open data, this is the first message I wanted to convey, is about APIs. 
APIs become the fundamental engines for the cities of tomorrow and the way services uh, will be delivered for the smart cities. We are talking about APIs that should provide access to a big amount of different data sources coming from sensors deployed on the city, coming from systems, from the citizens themselves, and with a number of features and challenges that have to be addressed by, uh, with those APIs. Talking about uh, being able to handle data at very large scale, uh, being able to support access policies in order to implement very much important concepts in real-time open data as it would be sovereign of data because owners of data have to be able to define the access policies that govern who can access my data when and for what uh, reason. And of course, APIs will become the language that cities speak. The cities speak uh, when dealing with the citizens, when dealing with the applications. That will be the common language. And cities and APIs, of course, are really a nice element, but may turn into a rather um, ugly thing, right? if we are not careful about that. May turn into evil because actually APIs might become the element through which you may get locked in by platform providers. Um, also, if you just deal with definition of your own APIs without really going for a standardization of those APIs, you will become an isolated niche, uh, not that much attractive for solutions developers. APIs bought online is what will create the market and why they are so important. And the reason why collaboration between cities is needed to agree on what could be the common API for getting access to real-time open data. Just imagine for a second that any application that runs on your smartphone, whenever it is launched, would be able to connect to a well-defined endpoint of the, cities where, of the city where you are uh, you know, uh, doing, and then it's able to get access to all information about what's going on ar around. That is going to be really a uh, game changer. And that is what we are trying to deliver with Fiverr and why we are convincing cities, cities to meet together, collaborate, defining a single common API for getting access to real-time data. I would say more. It's not something that is needed. It's a responsibility for cities. So clear messages for cities is you have to really collaborate to come up with this single common API that will become the fuel for new innovative services based on real-time open data. Is it only about the APIs? Is it only about defining a common language? Well, not really, not only. We may be talking about plans uh, for an hour and realize suddenly that the meaning of plant was different from each other. So we uh, really need to also talk about real-time interoperable open data. So it's not just about delivering data in a way that gets access real-time. It's also about uh, making you understandable because you are using the same data models, the same data models that everyone understands. So real-time, interoperable, open data is about APIs and data models. And again, collaboration is needed. Collaboration is a responsibility for cities trying to um, arrive to a same set of common standard models that get accessible through a common API. 
that is what the initiative Open and Agile Smart Cities was born. It was born because a number of cities realized they had that responsibility and they had to collaborate together in making decisions and agreeing on a common set of mechanisms. They agreed to adopt Fiware NGSI as the API, the standard de facto API for getting access to real-time open data. They agreed to collaborate on definition of common information models and the way those uh, information models that real-time open data will be published through uh, open data publication platform. An initiative that was born with just 25 cities in different countries, but now, and this week is going to be announced, will reach more than 100, wow. 100. The next station in the evolution will be going from real-time data to the economy of data, because not only the city will be the one that will bring data, also third parties bringing innovative business model for uh, uh, the creation of uh, new services. Again, going to the stand, you will see what we are doing in that area. Fiware and TM Forum is an organization where we are now creating a joint collaboration program to help cities in traveling this journey. Uh, going together, defining showcases, defining pilots around concrete uh, agreed challenges and come up with definition of those common information models they can adopt to create this kind of single uh, digital market for smart cities that is needed for make all this vision about smart cities uh, material uh, realizable. Just to finish, uh, it doesn't matter where you your city in this journey, but where your city wants to be. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. And uh, we move to the other side of the world. Well, actually, fiber is also like everywhere because you want to link everything. Uh, so next, uh, we have the senior manager from KT Corporation, Jin Cheok uh, Young, who is a smart city project manager with a, a decade of experience in the domain and who's led several projects across actually lots of the world, Korea, Emirates, Qatar, Malaysia, Indonesia. And uh, looking forward to hear about your insights on big data and open data. Yeah, thank you very much for the great introduction. So hola, como estas? So hello everyone, yeah, my name is Chin Hyuk Yang. Um, yeah, today I'm uh, very glad to be here to uh, share uh, KT Smart City data strategy. So uh, we all acknowledge that um, we are experiencing a flood of uh, information. So this radical uh, increase in the amount of data um, indicates that we need we need a new paradigm to handle the data, see, such big data. So uh, the increase in the amount of data uh, is not a problem, but a challenge and opportunity. So I believe that the data should be a key enabler for smart cities, especially big data. So uh, in a city, the huge amount of data are generated every day. For example, in Seoul, uh, 100 gigabytes of uh, uh, data are uh, created daily. So uh, if we can handle this uh, complexity of data that the, uh, the competitive uh, power of uh, uh, the organization will be increased. Yeah. So uh, let, me, uh, let me show you some uh, cases, uh, big data analysis cases, and how big data uh, can make a city smart. So in Seoul, uh, public transport runs, uh, doesn't run uh, between 1 a.m. to 5 a.m., but only taxi does. And the uh, transport users are mainly the low, I mean, uh, transport users at late night are mainly uh, low-income workers and students. So to respond to citizens' complaints that the Seoul Metropolitan Government decided to set up a new bus route at uh, late night, uh, but uh, with the limited resources like uh, buses, or drivers, and budget, 
then the optimizing the uh, optimizing the bus route based on the precise demand analysis was critical. So Seoul, work, uh, Seoul officials uh, worked directly with uh, Korea Telecom, and KT analyzed the uh, uh, data of uh, three billion uh, late night phone calls and met the commuter. Uh, 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 commute hotspots and uh, use the data to design the new bus route. So by tracking the usage that the, uh, uh, the city has been able to make an improvement of uh, design the new bus route and the new service new services has uh, has been a successful at for South City and the night bus serves more than uh, five to ten percent passengers. Then the bus service is running a comparable route, and this has to uh, this has led to the uh, led to the uh, cost saving for uh, each passenger. And another case is the avian influenza prevention project. So KT developed. Uh, a solution that uh, predict the transmission route of uh, the avian influenza uh, utilizing its big data solution. And the uh, result drawn from uh, avian influenza uh, outbreak using big data confirmed that the transmission route uh, is in large part identical to the travel, uh, vehicle travel route of uh, livestock and uh, poultry and uh, feed material delivery. So from the project, KT could predict the uh, uh, transmission uh, route with 87% uh, accuracy uh, and the save uh, uh, 1.8 billion US dollar a year. So this big data uh, analysis solution is not only for the uh, uh, avian influenza, but also for uh, other contagious diseases like uh, uh, MERS or uh, SARS or uh, Ebola and Zika as well. So big data strategy is about um, collecting data and um, finding out the patterns and uh, getting information from the and then utilizing them for uh, decision making. But besides big data, is open data is another uh, smart city strategy. Smart. So open data is data that anyone can. Uh, uh, access and use and share. So open data is about the transparency, about the giving uh, citizens access to the data that the text help uh, create and it's about innovation, which means that the soft, uh, enabling software developers to transform that data into uh, the applications uh, that make city services uh, provide available anytime, anywhere. So. Uh, so this, uh, there are three steps of open data uh, business model. The first step is uh, data aggregation. Uh, gaining data insights from the collected public data can generate a significant insights uh, through visual representation of the results of the data ag aggregation. The second, uh, the second step is uh, operational information, uh, improvement. So analysis of public data uh, can help companies reduce the cost and improve uh, operations like uh, weather and other data collected via satellites are uh, uh, already essential for the uh, predicting supply and demand in uh, uh, agriculture, logistics, and leisure. The third step is uh, uh, development of a new business. So companies that use uh, public data effectively can leverage uh, their experience and expertise uh, into uh, 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 profitable products. So let me introduce some of uh, KT's uh, app using open data. So KT's Ole Weather app uh, collects the weather and air uh, pollution data from Korea Meteorological Administration and provides the various weather related information like uh, a life index. Uh, recommend if you need uh, an umbrella today or it is, if it is a good weather for uh, uh, laundry, car washing, or picnic. And it also provides the uh, customized uh, uh, advertising. For example, uh, if it is the, uh, hot and dry, then a uh, sport drink uh, advertising pops up. And if it is uh, raining and humid, then uh, a moisture observer uh, advertising uh, pops up. 
And another case is the uh, Jeonju Gome, I, I mean Gome Jeonju app. So Jeonju is a city that uh, is famous for Korean traditional village and uh, great food. So uh, Je yeah, Jeonju City uh, government uh, hosted a citizen idea uh, contest and the one of the selected idea was putting every uh, tourism information on the one single app. And uh, uh, the local government uh, opened the data of the uh, uh, tourism information infrastructure and uh, public uh, transport and the location of a uh, public car park and public toilets. And uh, with that data that uh, KT uh, uh, developed uh, uh, this uh, Jeonju Gome app and uh, also this app provides not only the uh, uh, tourism, tourism information but also the uh, uh, trip planner uh, based on the uh, uh, personal interest and, uh, and their budget. So I have introduced some uh, KT's big data and open data cases, and there is a Korean saying that uh, how many you, uh, how many parts you have, uh, I mean, uh, no, ma no matter how many parts you have, uh, they are nothing uh, unless you thread them into a necklace. So if we say the open data is a, a each piece of pearl and downloading and using the uh, open data is threading the pearl into a necklace and an organization who is uh, uh, providing the open data, uh, the one who is uh, threading the uh, necklace. So if some pearls have uh, different colors or sizes or don't have a hole to be threaded, then it will be difficult to make them into a necklace. So therefore I would like to say that the uh, quality management and the user's data accessibility are as much important as just publishing the open data. Yeah, uh, this is my end of presentation, and thank you very much. Great. And last but not least, from Deutsche Telekom, Mr. Vitsu Pal, who has is leased the Big Data Strategic Initiative. Uh, EU initiative at the Deutsche Telekom and uh, has been in the Internet of Things and Big Data field uh, for quite a while and also involved, involved in the startup scene uh, as the uh, mentoring in the Challenge Up Incubator. So he also knows what's good in it for SMEs. So with the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good uh, morning or afternoon, everybody. My name is Vichy Upal. I'm from Deutsche Telekom, uh, responsible for big data and um, IoT in, in marketing in the Europe segment. So I'm the, the one which is between you and the lunch, so it's always a, a hard game to, to grab your attention. And also as I'm the last one from the panel, I thought I will change a little bit the way how I present and I want to inspire you. This is going to be, this is, this is basically the first and nearly the last one corporate slide you will see there. I think it's important to, to debate about real-time open data because it's quite long, you know, four words together. What does it mean? And I think it's amazing we can do that now because all the technology that, that actually happened in the last 10, 20 years enabled us to do, to capture amazing amount of data, work with them in real time. So I will bring you a little bit of my personal story, how I get involved in open data, um, how the technology actually followed my, uh, my path. And at the end, of course, I will also show you what we do in, as mobile operator and ICT provider. But we have heard quite a lot of from, from colleagues from GMSMA, GSMA and so on, and you can visit us on our stand. Um, so you can also see that this is, these are real projects. So let me start with my story. So um, how it was the opening of the public data in, in 80s. So you see this young boy, it doesn't look like, but it's me. Um, I was five, six years at that time, and my biggest hobby was this bike. <clears throat> so um, I was born in Prague, which is in the center of Europe. Um, I help you a little bit with the, with the point there, so that's Prague. And every summer I spent uh, nearly two months in a small village, 2,000 people called Mukasov, behind Prague by my uh, grandparents. It was super summer, you know, we had fun, all the fun we can have with uh, other friends. Now I live in Bonn, that's uh, this small point over there uh, uh, where Deutsche Telekom has got headquarters. I should have put there also Barcelona, sorry for that, but uh, you probably know where's Barcelona. So, and um, yeah, where's the open data story? So I, I call that where the streets had no name, actually. Uh, one summer it was 
1986 or 87, they decided finally in that small village during the summer to put street names there. It sounds funny, but there were no street names at that time. Uh, and the funny part was that uh, they didn't publish any map on that. The only map was actually at the office of the, of the major there. So uh, what we have done as boys, you know, we were you know, running in the streets, people were asking us for the names of the streets. So we said, yeah, let's use our bikes, run around and actually create our own map. So we created our own map. And then people asking us, like, can you share the map with us? Uh, you may imagine in 1986 or 7 there were no goods, you know, how we can copy that or, or do that. So we basically draw 50 maps like that and, and gave them to local tobacco store. And uh, guess what? Uh, we had a great summer with that because that was a great business opportunity. The guy sold it for roughly like one euro. And uh, that was one of the best summers for us at all because we had money for ice cream and, and uh, we, were, we were like local heroes opening the data public data that should have been open, but they were not. So let me jump then into 2000. Uh, when I graduated um, at the University of Economic Statistics, uh, I moved to the village and I became engaged in local politics and one of the projects I did there and still running local web pages. And uh, we were, I think, uh, you know, we, we had some vision what we want to do. We want to share information with people. We want to open as much as possible. And uh, second year, we have won a local prize for that, the Czech prize. So we, we became a top three Czech municipality website on that. Uh, what were the services that we were looking at that time? And, and I just trying to bring you from uh, 1996 to 2004 or six. So you see the shift in, in 20 years, street maps but they were not paper, they were digital at that time because there were no Google Maps, there was nothing like that. So people were coming to the web pages, see where to go. Discussion forum, people like to discuss about everything, mainly anonymized, but that's a different story. Local yellow pages um, also didn't exist at that time, it was just a paperwork. Uh, local bulletin, event calendar, business line, timetables. That was kind of real-time service at that time. And now let's jump another 10 years or 15 years in 2016. So if you look like what services are being used on the internet, um, the role of the municipality changed totally. Street maps, you look for Google. If you look for discussion forums, you go for Facebook or, or, um, or different services. Local ads, yellow pages, all on eBay or, or different servers. Bus lines, also a public service. So what's the role of, of local IT in, uh, in, in a village uh, by now? And with that, I'm <coughs> basically coming to uh, the point now. Why we speak about real-time public open data or big data. The major paradigm shift is that we, yeah, uh, we really, uh, the, the time changed. And you see in this graph that the prediction from Gardner, Cisco, Intel predicts billions of connected devices, sensors, phones in uh, 2020 or 2018. And the great thing by now, I think, and, and I was debating here uh, before I came here uh, in the hall with certain people, uh, we have, uh, everybody has, has this nice device in, in a pocket. Some of you have two. This is a sensor. So, and that's our role of, of Deutsche Telekom. We have a sensor data. We have heard it from GSMA, and we can provide it. Some of the cities invest heavily into sensors, uh, putting sensors into ground. Uh, but what I want to challenge you is like, why not to reuse existing data sets that are around there, what we've heard from JSMA. Uh, we have anonymized data on, on people's positions, profiles. We have anonymized data about car fleets, uh, which we're also running. And this is already a solid base to do something which we now call uh, traffic and crisis management or do predictions and evaluate projects, uh, origination, destination matrix. And you may imagine millions of use cases which can come with that. So I brought three examples here, and then I will start with, uh, let me say, offline analytics. First of them, opening two uh, subway stations or metro station in Prague. The city came to us and said, can you prove if it works, if people move from tram to, to, uh, to this subway? So uh, there was a comparison of uh, origination, destination matrix and, and heat maps of people, and you see the red, uh, the red spots or the, the black uh, spots there it proved that actually more people are now coming to these places where the new stations are open. This is what we can do uh, quite easily. Uh, usually the cities count it manually, um, then you have some problems with weather and so on, the data can be spoiled. If you use the data in an anonymized way, you can look one month backwards, one month forwards, and so on. 
The second uh, project, there is a wrong subtitle, it's not opening a new metro station, but it's opening a new tunnel. So the tunnel actually was open after 20 years, billions of investment, and then uh, politicians has problems because people start shouting, we have a problem, there are traffic jams. How to prove that? So they also use these data, and uh, what we were able to identify, which city areas actually improved, uh, that are the blue ones, and which get worse, the red ones. Some of them were affected by local uh, congestions, but on the other hand, it was good for the, for the major to have a hard facts and come and say, this is what we know. We also know here that in this segment, we need to improve it. So they were working on with hard facts, not just based on what people were shouting. And now I'm coming to the real time, and, and real time is really amazing. Uh, this product, uh, we work with uh, one university, uh, Deutsche Telekom. It's based on combination of network data and fleet data. And it's basically giving a powerful tool to the city to see people uh, in real time in the city, that's the heat map, and also traffic over that. You see there is a time scale, so um, if it's used by firemen, they can shift backwards, forward. I think now we, we're developing some automatic workflow function, so if some crowd is growing, they can get automatic alerts and so on. Of course, it's open system on an API, so we can inject uh, video cameras and so on on one side. On the other side, you can track this data out and you can do public alerting on that. And, and this, is, this is how we see the future of, of real-time data in the cities. Because um, if you imagine that you put uh, water sensors in this uh, and there is a flooding, you immediately see where the people you can evacuate them. The same if you put the pollution sensor, there is an incident in the fabric, it blows up, you want to evacuate people, you don't have to evacuate the whole city. If you have the wind layer, uh, it all goes on. So um, I'm already... Uh, I'm already at the end of that. So what do we see? Uh, what do we see here? It's it's important to inspire public sector with that. We see a lot of crash cities coming uh, to us and asking how we can work together. It's not just about public, but it's about the PPP cooperation that, um, and and these tools are really powerful to help the city to move forward. Thank you. Thanks. So where's my gadget? Thanks, Emilian. Uh, thanks for the speakers for great timekeeping. So we are nicely on schedule here and uh, have a few minutes for, for, for questions. Uh, uh, some from the, from the screen and some from the floor. Anyone, anybody has a very burning issue on their mind at this very moment, you can't just wait to address. Then I draw one of these. Uh, to, uh, I thought this, this would come, so this is for Moscow. <clears throat> how do you assure profile anonymity and how can you guarantee the data from the, the databases is not transferred or sold to third parties? Well, that's, that's, that's it's on, yeah. yeah. There's another mic uh, on that table as well. Then. Yeah, okay. Um, of course, uh, there are uh, some levels of security of personal data. Uh, starting from an infrastructure, all our data centers are certified by tier three and higher. And we have a uh, middleware uh, security uh, from uh, network attacks and from hacker attacks and so on and so forth, from DDoS attacks. And also on the application level, there are a lot of uh, some stuff for security of the personal data. So, and uh, um, we, every year we have, uh, by Russian law, we have to go through the certification process from a special authority in Russian Federation, which come and see through all our systems, how do we work with personal data? Mm. And we have to get a certificate. If we have no certificate for the system, we cannot use the system. So uh, we have a lot of security stuff and security things, and we have a lot of uh, certificates for each system, so we are absolutely sure about the personal data of the citizens, and they will be never stolen, or uh, how to say, swim out from the data center. Mm. I will follow that up with the, uh, it's always a hot topic in these discussions, the uh, privacy issue, with another question which is about the uh, uh, securing the uh, privacy at large in these cases. I think the main, main point I would like to ask is about triangulation of data. If you use, for example, mobile operator data and triangulate that with other open data sources, is there a possibility there for privacy impeachment even though the, none of the data sets alone would give you private information combining data sets might. So how, for example, in the cases from, uh, 
from Deutsche Telekom have you approached that? I think for for Deutsche Telekom security is a, is a top issue, so or top uh, top topic. So we carefully look at um, the use cases which we're putting to the market. Definitely, I think there is a regular rehashing of the, of the identity, so it cannot be tracked uh, fully in mm. that. And um, yeah, you're right. It's it's an issue, but uh, I think so far we are quite uh, strong in that, uh, and um, also uh, how we prepare the data and how we transfer that. Yeah. And from GSMA, about your cases, have you uh, met any? So, yeah, so all, all of those cases, all of the data is completely anonymized. So actually, when you're looking at um, how people move, you know, operators very good at, um, you know, looking at the base stations themselves. So, so you've got to so follow partitioning, one mobile. Yeah, so, part well, no, you can't follow one mm. single. So partitioning the city into a grid, essentially, and looking at, you know, what, how many people are in each of those grid squares and how they move between each grid. So rather than, you know, person A lives at, this address works there, yeah, yeah. and you know that that level of data is not available um, through through the mobile networks, basically. And in KT, I yeah. guess you have a similar. Yeah, solution. so uh, we have a data cleansing system. So we, after we collecting the all data from mobile, or, or also we had uh, some other projects with the uh, credit card company about uh, tracking the tourist uh, uh, credit card usage. That we uh, all the clear the data of the uh, personal information and mm. uh, so, yeah, up to now yeah, we have no issue yet. Yeah. Very good. And then I'll ask from uh, Juan how about Firewave. Do you see that the, uh, regardless, I mean, would you see the development of APIs also to de develop towards directions where the individual users as users can have a better control of, because these questions are always asked, so better visibility and control of where their data is and the management tools. Would you see that as part of a Fireware? Yes, actually, there is one concept that uh, we are now working very strongly uh, on it, which is the concept of sovereign of data. And that meaning that uh, there is this concept of who is the owner of data and what he wants to do with it. Uh, because it may happen that in this economy of data, it may be offering that data for free for some given purposes, for some uh, players to work with that data, but not to other ones. So being able to design the APIs and evolve them to allow this fine-grained um, access policy on data is a key issue for the APIs of the future. Very good. And we have one from the floor over here. Um, <coughs> yeah, good tell, afternoon. Tell us who you are, yeah, if sure. it's polite. Hi, I'm uh, Lev Gonick from uh, Cleveland, Ohio, in the United States. Um, I'm running away from uh, Donald Trump, so I'm here, thank you. <laughs> um, I have a question about uh, the infrastructure required in the next uh, three to five years as we move from data pinging off of our cell phones to the integration of CCTV and crowdsource video content for the kind of uh, services that should support uh, the city going forward. So who tackles that? Next generation infrastructures. Uh, uh, you know, um, infrastructure on different levels, of course. Data centers and hardware, storage and so on and so forth, and uh, networks. And, and uh, well, In Moscow we have 140,000 video cameras around the city, uh, online, and HDTV, uh, and we, see, we have a central storage to analyze this information. We have uh, more than uh, 50 thousand uh, cars with uh, GPS navigation and controlling them. We have uh, a lot of uh, stuff in IoT things and so on. And what we see that the infrastructure uh, cannot, um, probably couldn't uh, develop uh, as, as what originally. What I mean? I mean that's some kind of a blockchain technologies and uh, we are now testing a blockchain as a, <coughs> a diversified and geographically diversified storage for information with uh, some mathematics algorithm of uh, consistency of those data. Probably that would be the future because we mm. cannot pay more and more servers and storage stuff and uh, we probably have to uh, re 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 reuse the mathematics algorithms and go further with that. So I think that the future is some, somewhere there. Yeah, I think pentabytes of data is one of the challenges uh, we are facing. Signal yeah. to noise ratio, right? The signal yeah, to that noise is true, ratio. yeah. What's the, what's the right resolution to capture the data so that it doesn't clog everything? Uh, yeah, Juan, I, I wanted topic? to mention only one concept that will be fundamental to address that challenge, which is federation, because 
data will not be hosted in a single place. Right. And there will be many different actors playing this uh, role of context information brokers or open data brokers. And the essential for this to happen and to work is that APIs are defined, standardized for supporting this federation. Thank All you. right. And with that, uh, okay, I'll let Maybe one, have the one uh, final that, word. What, yeah, what, <laughs> what we see is uh, many cities invested into big data lakes, but meanwhile they became kind of big data swamps. So uh, it's, uh, it's about pre-aggregation of the data, maybe like in, in a folk somewhere, uh, blockchain. And it, it's a big challenge because the amount of data will be so so big that, that it will have to go project by project and, and yes. a vision is necessary to, to manage that. And any 10 second last few points from you guys? You're fine. Very good. Uh, all right, so then with this uh, bright view to the future, we'll conclude the session. Thanks for the uh, full house we had here. And especially thanks for the great speakers, really dense stuff we heard.